Okay, hello everybody to the seminar today. Uh, just a friendly remind to everyone that please put your electronic devices in silent mode so to avoid any kind of interruption and distraction. For today's presentation, we have a conference titled Rubber Bank Terminal, Overwater Site Investigation, a Case Study. So this presentation provides a look into a complex marine geotechnical investigation near Vancouver, British Columbia in 2016. Work include a number of deep, more than 100 meters, geotechnical tests using different techniques, as well as a variety of sampling. The presentation looks at the goals of the investigation, the challenges faced in the execution of the program, and the creative solution techniques used to collect the data. And for this investigation, we have with us to Max. Max is a professional engineer who graduated from the University of British Columbia in 2013. Max started with the Contech family of companies as a field engineer in 2013, performing technical duties on numbered tailing in numerous tailing re related projects across Canada and the US. He quickly progressed his knowledge and experience by conducting and eventually supervising various site investigations around the world, start helping start the international division working in Europe, Africa, and Australia. Since 2017, Matt has worked as a supervisor, operational manager for both Matt Bay Drilling and Contact, and now is the regional manager of Western Canada for Contact. So please join me welcoming Max. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for having me. As Daniel very nicely introduced me. I'm Max, and I'm presenting on this project, Roberts Bank Terminal. Uh, I'll kind of review previous work that was completed in the area, as well as going into this very complex uh, geotechnical investigation. So let's get started. Here we go. So what is geotechnical site characterization? So we're out there to fully understand the geological and engineering properties of a location and to try to get those parameters to a known amount with the least uncertainty as possible. It's a bit of an en like engineering problem and a bit of an iterative process sometimes. So it goes from desktop studies to initial geotechnical assessments, full-scale ground investigation, and sometimes you need to go and collect more data after the initial uh, site characterization. So what we're focusing on though, is the ground investigation. That's what Cone Tech and Mud Bay do. And this is a particularly interesting ground investigation. So geotechnical site investigation methods, there's plenty. Um, we specialize in geophysics, in-situ testing, drilling sampling, and laboratory testing. And for most large infrastructure projects, or tailings projects, your investigation will feature all of them in some sort of magnitude. So background on Roberts Bank. So Roberts Bank is a current operating terminal just south of Vancouver in Tawasson, BC. It's currently a coal and container port and is incredibly busy. Uh, as you can see, like Western Canada, and especially in Vancouver, has limited area and a large population, major Western port. So independent forecasts show that uh, the West Coast of Canada will require additional container capacity. So they're using the existing Roberts Bank terminal and hoping to double capacity for the container port by making a extension off of it and building reclaimed land. So initially in 2015, I was also lucky enough to be part of this program. Uh, an initial assessment of the site conditions were made. So this program involved 14 CPTs to about 50 meters, six mud rotary boreholes with shelbies and spoon testing, 
And there wasn't like a refusal depth. Everything was just to 50 meters. It was a target depth. We needed to see what was going on out there. there were, you know, we know we're, we're in the Fraser River. So there's like silt, sand, deltaic formation, but not very much information had been collected. So here's some pictures of the first investigation, 2015. Incredibly beautiful place to be in the summertime. Um, we were working off of this spud barge 24 hours a day. This is the nice picture of the night using a mud rotary drill that you can sort of see here. So after that successful program, um, the designers took that information, looked at it, sort of again in that iterative process, decided that they needed some more in situ data. They needed deeper data. They were looking for the clay contact that we know is very deep down there as well as looking for the till. Um, the initial idea was that the silt sands were liquefiable. So to help them further with their foundation design, deeper data, very important. Uh, They're also looking for continuous soil pour. The mud rotary program had done spoon testing, which gave them disturbed grab samples, but only every five feet or 1.5 meters. So there's lots of discontinuity in that data. Um, as well, the other important part was looking for uh, shear wave velocities, uh, also important in liquefaction analysis. So the 2016 scope of work that was laid out in front of us is 28 CPTs and SCPTs up to 150 meters, which was the approximate estimated clay contact depth, seven uh, electronic vein shear tests in boreholes up to 150 meters, and then 48 boreholes, uh, sonic disturbed and undisturbed Shelby tube samples were required um, velocity, shear wave velocity was required in the till, needed to sort of understand the strength properties of the till layer. And as, as you can see with the blue dots, there is an offshore component as well as an onshore component. So the execution of this, as you can imagine, uh, boreholes up to 150 meters, and especially this many boreholes takes a lot of time. Um, so there's lots of cost and schedule efficiency implications uh, with a program like this. You have many pieces of equipment. You have barges, you have drills, you have in situ testing equipment, lots of manpower. And so, you know, understanding the time involved as well as like weather patterns in the area, as you'll see, uh, are very important, not only for schedule, but for cost. And uh, yeah. The other implications here are we're doing tests up until 150 meters. Most, you know, on land infrastructure projects in the city, your test steps vary, but, you know, typically you're looking at about a 30 meter investigation. Um, I would say it's not out of the normal to go up to about 60 or 70 meters, but 150 meters is an incredibly deep um, testing. So lots of logistical challenges in that and like even just the implementation of our, like how do we get tooling that deep? Um, how does the equipment function at depths like that? Um, so that was all very important and like good things to consider. So I keep talking about tooling and equipment. So what do we have there for in-situ testing? We have seismic CPTU. So we have 150 megapascal capacity cones with pore pressure transducers that you know, in clay that deep, we're looking at core pressure readings up to about 500, 700 meters of head. 20 ton ram set that can be integrated into the drill for efficiency. So we don't need two separate rigs or pieces of equipment. Um, they're interested in shear wave velocity. So we need to have a seafloor mechanical hammer that can create the shear waves that can be read at 150 meters. There's downhole seismic testing. Um, so that was put in place in case the cone couldn't reach full depth, and then we could do shear wave velocity readings in the borehole um, that we knew we could make to depth. 
There's also vein shear testing, uh, which we'll get into, but this was our context digital system to get a high degree of accuracy and resolution. Um, and the veins come in variable sizes. The smallest ATM, ASTM uh, size that we had at the time was 40 by 80 mils, um, which could read up to about 325 kPa. So here are some pictures of the equipment on site uh, for the in-situ testing. This is the integrated ram set. It can get winched on and off to most types of drill rigs and changes your drill rig from just a standard drill rig to a 20 ton CPT push capacity. This is the underwater seismic source. Uh, so self-contained, uh, totally sealed and watertight, gets lowered to the sea floor and there's a little mechanical hammer uh, with a up hole trigger that uh, the engineer operates. And this is our vein, electronic vein shear testing uh, motor. So that spins at a controlled rate, again, controlled by the engineer. So you have a little bit of variable control. And then drilling, that was a very important part. Undisturbed samples were key, uh, as well as wanting to see that continuous soil core to see any type of layering effects. So uh, the drill that we propose is what we like to call the utility knife of drills. It's the Fort Longyear LS 600. It's a full size sonic rig. So it's got the 150 Hertz head, which is a tremendous amount of power. Uh, we know that it can get to those very deep depths, but it's also capable uh, with a few modifications to do mud rotary drilling as well, being able to switch simultaneously on the fly between the two. Uh, we had drilling fluid circulation, because as you can imagine, a program of this length, we're trying to reduce as much waste and cuttings as we can, because we have a limited amount of room. Uh, we did hydraulic fixed piston Shelby sampling to collect those undisturbed samples. And uh, since we were set trying to collect undisturbed samples in like silty sand material, which is fairly unusual because normally it's just done in fine grain. We use uh, stainless steel sharpened Shelby tubes to really try to get as clean of a cut and as undisturbed sample as we possibly could. So that's a lot of different uh, equipment. Uh, how do you fit it all into a barge? Well, you can see here, it's pretty tight. Uh, but what we did is we utilized a two barge system. These barges, for everybody's reference, are about 40 feet by 80 feet. So we have a crane that has the, you know, extra consumables. Uh, you can see here the used mud disposal in this large white tank. Because we're planning on being out there for about a month and a half to two months. You know, uh, we want to be as self-sufficient as possible floating out in the middle of the ocean, going for resupplies, waste dumps, extra, you know, trying to mobilize equipment is really hard. So, you know, ahead of time, you want to be as prepared as possible and uh, minimize any extra trips. So you can sort of see here, this is our standard layout. The sonic rig is down on the drilling scow. We have our mud recycling system, uh, core boxes and our data collection office. Uh, I mean, office is a really nice word for it, uh, but more of a little shack. Um, and then we have the support crane. So the crane would help us move the you know, full core boxes from one to the other safely. So people aren't hand, hand bombing them. Uh, we'd be removing the waste mud over and uh, going from there. So, we're going out with all this equipment. What are the key questions? What are we trying to get out of this? Uh, what are the groundwater conditions? Is it saturated? And you may think this is a funny question to ask because we're drilling the ocean floor. Shouldn't it not be saturated? Uh, we'll get to that a little bit at the end of the presentation if I have enough time. Um, what's the stratigraphy? Uh, the previous investigation only got to 50 meters. So, you know, there's a lot of data missing. Uh, the strength and stress history, what is the soil state, liquefaction on a large infrastructure project like this is like of utmost importance. Um, so we're trying to see if the soil is contractive or dilative. 
And then again, this all drives the foundation design and soil densification. So getting a little bit into the methodology, not sure how familiar everybody is with the different in situ testing, but CPT. So for these CPTs, they're going to an incredible depth. Uh, so they need to be completed uh, in a certain way. So how we went about this is we did one push from the mud line to about 50, sometimes up to 90 meters. Uh, like we call that our initial refusal depth. And then we would take the sonic rig, we drill out the depth of the initial push, case it off, providing rod support for the CPT and deploy the CPT again, um, getting up to about a hundred or plus meters. Uh, for the really deep CPTs, you see sort of uh, diminishing returns at, with your drill out and your push because the vertical thrust that you are putting on the top of the cone sort of gets displaced. Even with great rod support, you lose a lot of that thrust into a horizontal direction. So once you get over a hundred meters, you start having to drill out and you, maybe then you only get 20 meters on your third push and then you get 10 meters on your fourth push. So uh, we managed to do that, but it was definitely a lengthy process. And then the other thing that you're concerned about on that is heave and getting stuff stuck in your casing. So you can't actually deploy your CPT. So we used uh, weighted drill mud to try to mud balance the hole. So this is a CPT. Hopefully everybody's maybe more or less seen it. Uh, but a few main parameters that we're collecting. Uh, tip, the force that's acting on this area here. The pore pressure transducer has got this little filter right there that measures the water pressure. And then the friction sleeve, which sort of measures the horizontal load and the friction of the soil. Uh, ours, our cones come with built-in geophones, so we can measure shear wave and compression waves. And there is also a little gyroscope in there for inclination. So for those of, that may not have seen, this is your typical cone plot. So you have tip, your sleeve, rod friction, and your pore pressure. And then here you can see on the far right side is your soil behavior type. Uh, that is an interpreted parameter, uh, but it gives you an idea of what you're pushing in. So soil behavior type is, like I mentioned, an interpreted parameter. Uh, it's found by plotting tip resistance versus the fric friction ratio, which is your sleeve readings over your tip times 100. Um, can also be normalized for depth and effective stress. But uh, the soil behavior type is not actually a direct measure of grain size or like plasticity. So it is exactly, won't always match up with your like uh, USC like soil classification, but uh, it's generally a really close relationship and it's soil behavior type is an indication of how your soil is acting. Like, is it acting like a silt? Is it acting like a clay? So uh, pore pressure dissipation is very important. It gives you your parameters uh, for your groundwater, saturation, a little bit of porosity. So you can see these are like your typical responses, clean sand and a clay with your excess pore pressure slowly tapering off to your equilibrium, and then a dilated response. Seismic, uh, so I've talked a lot about shear, shear wave velocities being important. How we go about collecting those, we stop pushing every meter, uh, take a few hits by either, you know, generating some sort of shear wave source, whether it's the little mechanical hammer on the bottom or somebody with a sledgehammer up top. You measure the time it takes for those shear waves to reach the cone, and then you are subtracting in a pseudo interval uh, method. So, you know, uh, the delta T then gives you your velocity. So here, that's sort of the output of the shear waves that we generate. You can see how, you can see trend lines, um, which indicate the speed. So a steeper line indicates faster speed. So, 
Uh, just quick mention of liquefaction because it's very important here. So uh, yeah, very important for this. Mostly what we're looking for is we are looking for whether soil is contractive, which is bad, versus dilative, which is good. Um, and especially for pile design, large infrastructure work, key parameter. And the CPT is quite good at, as a sort of finder of this information. So this is the clean sand equivalent normalized tip value um, presented by Robinson and Ride. The value of 70 is sort of used as an indication whether of a, the difference between a dilative and contractive soil. So we're looking for the values to be, yeah, good, good, strong, and be plotted happily above that line. So methodology for the vein shear testing. Um, the mini vein was developed for the deep VST because, you know, uh, clay under with that much soil on top of it, it's very stiff uh, and has been compressed. So one of the other things that we had to develop for this program was a fast deployment, uh, going to 150 meters and one meter lengths with a cable through uh, every rod, it takes forever. Uh, so we had to develop a methodology that used the load cells on top, measured the friction at the top, and then had ways to remove additional friction through the system uh, by back calculating. So we were able to do that with the sonic rods, uh, so that really saved time on the tripping in and out. And we installed a friction coupler uh, down below that allowed us to measure and get the rods moving before the actual blade starts turning. So you can measure the amount of friction through the system before the blade actually engaged. Also had a rate controlled torque motor up hole and it was independent from the barge. Cause as you can imagine, the barge is moving up and down. If your system is moving up and down, you're no longer just shearing along the one plane, you're shearing a bunch of planes. Um, so that was key as well. So here is the typical electronic vein shear test. As you can see, you get really great resolution. You are, everything is very controlled, you know, uh, especially compared to manual veins where, you know, it's being spun by hand and, you know, covered in mud and splattered. So that's sort of what that looks like. Uh, there was a bearing that we had to develop that uh, took the weight of the rods and that's some of the friction that we are trying to reduce and reduce wear and tear on the motor. So drilling sampling, uh, sonic coring uh, for the disturbed sample, as I mentioned, a system that let us like on the fly switch from mud rotary uh, from sonic to mud rotary to allow us to have that undisturbed sampling. Uh, so we would switch maybe three meters above uh, the desired test depth and then mud rotary for a very low disturbance, high quality Shelby tube as the sonic drill sort of has a zone of disturbance in front of it as it's vibrating in. And yeah, I uh, mentioned the Shelby tubes with the hydraulic fist piston, you can see here, does the sharpened edge down to five degrees. So yeah, careful handling was needed. And we managed to get very high quality samples uh, in the silty sands, which uh, was a very cool thing to do. So for those of you that may not be familiar with sonic drilling, uh, sonic drilling, you create a vibration through the rods by two counter rotating elements. And then those, that frequency goes down the drill and sort of liquefies the soil around the drill column to allow it to pass into the sonic core barrel as you're advancing. Once you have finished advancing your core barrel, uh, typically in 10 to 20 foot lengths, you override your larger casing that is like a tight fit, but fits right over. Sometimes you use a little bit of water to help clear any sediment from in between the two, but you don't necessarily need to. Then you retract your core barrel, you get a full continuous 10 foot to 20 foot sample, and then you just repeat. So uh, it's a fully cased borehole, 
you get incredible detail and uh, you can see all the layers that you will in your uh, soil column. So here's some nice pictures of the sonic rig, not on a crowded barge. Um, you can kind of see back to back, there's a support unit with mechanical means to help lift all this casing and steel. It's very heavy. Um, there's a happy drill crew. So yes, so field work execution. So this was the team that was all involved. The client was the Port of Vancouver. Uh, consultant was Stantec. Comtech was the prime contractor. Mud Bay Drilling did the sonic and mud rotary work. And then we had uh, barge support as well as water taxi. So as I mentioned, you know, uh, cost and schedule impl implications. Uh, the best time to plan a program like this is in the summer. It's beautiful. There's no, you know, inclement weather is not, uh, not a big concern. You don't get winter storms like you do in Vancouver, in theory. Um, so, you know, when we were talking with Stan Tech and making the plan, we're looking at this historic wind road rows. So you can see uh, the color indicates the wind speed and the wind direction. Uh, northwest is a bad wind direction. That is not what you want. Uh, but you can look here and during the summertime, we're looking, this looks great. You know, uh, there's not very much wind, waves and it, stuff shouldn't be an issue. Unfortunately for us, this is what we got. It was uh, like a 95th percentile uh, out of the ordinary season. Uh, so that was incredibly challenging. Uh, we were getting white caps starting at about 10 to 15 knots and on site sort of had to shut drilling down whenever it got over 50 knots because the waves were too great and that posed a safety hazard. So I was, I got to learn a lot about meteorology that year. I'm a civil engineer, but also, yeah, have now a little bit of background as a weatherman. Um, which was pretty, pretty fun and exciting, but this caused like a lot of challenges for the program. Um, schedule delays, uh, we had to sort of plan around weather windows when we could go out and operate because these holes take a very long time and you can't move off a hole once you've started, like you can't just leave your casing in the ground. Everything has to come out and you have to start again. So it's pretty challenging. Um, so let's see if I can. Play video, maybe. So yeah, you can just sort of see, uh, you know, we're dealing with waves coming over the side and, and whatnot. This was one of the days that, you know, we sort of wanted to see how bad 20, uh, 20 knots of wind was and it turned out it was pretty bad. Um, but it's things like that uh, cause lots of delay. So that was a big challenge of the field work. So, you know, best laid plans uh, don't always work out. So the data. So uh, over the whole course of the project, uh, we did over 2,600 meters of SCPT and CPT. The deepest cone that we managed to push was 135 below mud line. That was completed in two pushes. Uh, the deepest CPT was 145, again, in two pushes. Max water depth was about 18 meters. So you can see here, this is an example plot. So what do we see here? Sort of what we expected, deltaic silt sand interbedded uh, all the way down until this lower clay interface at about 130 meters. Uh, so that was pretty exciting for us when we finally, finally hit that clay and the client was very excited uh, so they could actually get some idea of the depth of that in interface. Uh, generally here on the pore pressure, you have hydrostatic conditions more or less uh, through the silt sands and the soil behavior type uh, normalized for depth uh, and effective stress 
works really well. Uh, you can see we're looking at a lot of like it's saying silt sand, silt sand, silt sand, all the way down to clay. And that was confirmed with the continuous core of Sonic. So you can see here, this is just sort of a shotgun plot of the uh, soil behavior type, just showing you it's plotting in and around where it should be. And then looking at the clay layer, uh, generally the hole is loose and contractive throughout. So you can see it's following falling below that normalized tip value, clean sand equivalent of 70. So that wasn't great. And then the lower clays are normally consolidated, an OCR over consolidation ratio of one. So that sort of jives uh, unglaciated, it's like young deposit. So that all made, made sense. So, uh, the lower clays. This is why we're doing vein shear testing. We're wanting to find the undrained shear strength of this clay. Uh, so based off of the first pass of the interpreted values from the cone, we're looking at a shear strength of about uh, 300 kPa. So that is a little bit of an issue because our max vein that we had at the time uh, read only uh, up to about 325. So if there was much deviation, we wouldn't be able to get a reading like that. So what did we do? We developed the tiny vein. Um, so this was a 40 by 40 double tapered miniature vein uh, that let us read up to about 676 kPa of strength. So that was uh, developed, yeah, on the fly project which was kind of neat. Uh, we tried a couple of the 40 by 80s and they just kept uh, over, overloading and we were not able to reach the peaks. So this is a plot from the program. So you can see the initial or the peak stress uh, red with the 40 by 40 vein was about 550 kPa. Then you remove this this is the friction uh, correction. So that is from the 15 degree slip coupler that engages the rods before it engages the blade. So we're measuring how much it takes to engage the rods. And then uh, you also removed, if I can flip back, you're also removing, because this vein is so small, this little tiny stub, as it's called, is no longer negligible. It actually has like a noticeable effect in your, in your shear. So we're also removing that. So you can see corrected. The corrected values there are 383. And that drives quite well with an NKT value of 12, uh, you know, which falls into the normal uh, NKT value of around 11 to 16. And so we were very happy with these results and the client was also very happy and gave them that site specific factor that they were looking for. So the overwater seismic, um, you can see this deep SCPTU, time domain plot. Uh, we had excellent signal all the way down to 135 meters, which was awesome. Um, super clear, very repeatable signal. You can, so how we get such a great signal all the way down to that depth is we do a five uh, stacking procedure. So five traces are recorded at every depth. Those are then put on top of each other uh, to help increase the signal to noise ratio. And then that helped us. You can see here, this is the raw signals all layered on top of each other. Then when it's, they're combined, and a little filter put over them. Uh, it's very clear, super repeatable signal. Uh, this is like ideal seismic data. So once we've taken that, uh, done our plotting, you can sort of see here that we're looking at a VS. So the shear wave velocity for the top 30 meters is 179. That puts it as a seismic site class E, which is like soft soils, not very great. Uh, 
So the shear wave velocity and the tip are independent cyclic liquefaction uh, parameters for the cyclic resistance ratio. So things, yeah, are looking a little bit soft and liquefiable. Uh, for the offshore downhole seismic, uh, which was done in the borehole uh, to get some strength parameters for the clay, you can see that it was incredibly successful too, getting good clear readings. And then you can see here, we're into the till and you can see the jump in the shear wave velocity up to 600 meters per second. So that gives you a very clear indication that you hit your uh, till contact. Am I doing okay on time? Okay, perfect. Okay, so now the saturation question. Um, so as I mentioned before, we're doing an investigation of the ocean floor. Should not everything be saturated? That would be the easy basic thought. So uh, compression waves, I've been talking a lot about shear waves. Compression waves are the other seismic wave that we're reading. They are more or less an on off switch for saturation. So you can see here, at 90% saturation, you're looking at a compression wave velocity of about 400 meters. And then on a log scale, as you're climbing up, uh, a full, fully saturated, you'd be expecting about 1600. So uh, compression waves are a great indicator of like saturation. That's sort of often why we're collecting that data. And you can see from our plot here, that even though you know zero is the mud line, you are in the ocean, you have up to 18 meters of water above you, we are sitting well below that 1600 meter per second line. Um, and that's sort of very odd. That isn't what we would expect at all. And so why is that? So with further lab testing and taking a look, uh, the thought is there's entrained air due to organic decay through the upper silt sands. And you know, uh, our compression wave source only let us get to about 22 meters of depth. And even at 22 meters, uh, we're only at 800 meters per second. So we're looking at, you know, pulling from this chart here, you know, 99, 0.95, something like that, um, which you know sounds basically saturated, but in the liquefaction world, that difference can make a lot. Um, so unsaturated soils are compressible and dampen contractive behavior. So your liquefaction potential is lower in them. And the, yeah, so the decrease in the saturation can delay the liquefaction, which, yeah. And so that's very important for their design. And like, this was, a, very weird behavior when we were recording the data. It's not something that's often seen, but the organic decay and entrained air is, uh, yeah, kind of a shocking discovery. Counterintuitive to what you would think. So yeah, uh, just in sort of in summary, we completed a comprehensive site investigation uh, in deep and loose soils to full depth. That was incredibly exciting and those are some of the deepest cone holes in cone tech history uh, and definitely the deepest vein vein shear testing that we've ever done uh, special qa qc is required when performing all these tests learning on the fly uh, the vein shear tests and having to understand all of the extra frictional components that need to be removed does your data make sense developing new tools to like to help the data make sense um, all very important parts uh, i think when you're when you're completing a geotechnical site investigation the doesn't make sense part is really important being able to step back understand what you've actually collected and trying to fit that in uh, combination techniques provided operational versatility being able to collect undisturbed samples sonic core all these in situ tests was, it gave a wide range of data and engineering parameters for the foundation designers to use. And then 
the laboratory data on the Shelby tubes um, will be a great complementary source as well. So yeah, uh, we'd just like to, yeah, acknowledgements for the Port of Vancouver, the field crew, Stan Tech for letting us share some of this information. That's super great. Uh, I want to thank Jamie Sharp for putting together the slides for me. And then um, I've just got a fun little sort of drone video that our water taxi guy captured while we were out there uh, to finish it off. And then I'll field some questions. <laughs> Yeah, so thanks so much. Uh, not every day we got to see orcas, but we did get to see orcas some days, which was a pretty nice perk of being on the job. Yeah, if anybody has questions, thank you. Okay, so now let's go into the Q&A session. So as always, we are going to have questions from people in, in Zoom, um, questions from people here in the room. So let's begin with the people in the room. Any question here? Okay, so wait for that. Hi, hello, my name is Rebecca. Thank you for my presentation. I have a question. Uh, what was the drilling rate? The drilling yeah. rate, yeah. So again, sort of diminishing returns as you go deeper. Um, I would say that you know, on a good day in the top 60 meters, we were probably going about five meters an hour or so. Um, if we were just sonic coring, of course, you know, extra care had to be done for the Shelby tube samples. We would push the Shelby tube samples in and then sit on them for like, let them sort of set for about half an hour before we pull them out. So that obviously slows down. And then once we got uh, very deep, like a hundred meters plus, uh, I would say the drilling rate probably fell to about a meter an hour, like all things considered. As you get deeper, even with the sonic drill and you're creating a little bit of liquefaction around you know, your column, there's still huge amounts of friction and like horizontal stresses going on that sort of lock in your, your casing. And so you need to keep sort of drilling larger and larger casing above that to help relieve some of that frictional component. So yeah, variable, but once, once you're like drilling more than about 100 meters depth, whether on the ocean or on land, with sonic drilling, yeah, about a meter to maybe two meters an hour. Thank you. Yeah. Easy. Any other question here? Sense of resolution means Kevin Moore. Um, uh, the bank shear stuff is actually very impressive because you don't see like more people who haven't done bank shear testing before, but this depth is insane. Insane, yeah. Um, so, with that in mind, I'm just wondering if you were involved in the corrections that were made because yeah. the, the torque on the rods at that depth is. is insane. Yeah, it's very, very um, high. And I feel like the coupler wouldn't be. Enough to, to, to correct the whole that torque that you're actually applying through a hundred meters plus of rods. Yeah, so so that's a that's a good question. Um, so I didn't really get in get into it 
too much because I was trying to keep this a little bit tight, but there's a few slides on there that show a little bit more in depth those corrections. Um, I had mentioned a bearing. That was a big part of it, uh, you know, in the initial um, sort of thought process behind this. Without having the smooth bearing rotation on the top and, you know, potential for, you know, friction between the casing and the rods themselves, like that's also like a big factor. The bearing helped keep, keep everything centered and like running smoothly through there. Uh, the other part that we were really uh, careful with was that the vein shear tests, they happened. Uh, so you have like your large uh, drilling rod string. And then we're adapting down to a small nilcon rod that's I'm gonna say about a centimeter in diameter. And we will only have one of those on the end of the, the uh, drill string. And then we're poking the vein only maybe half a meter out of the bottom of the borehole to try to keep that like the friction, like frictional part between the soil and the rods like minimal. So the rest, in theory is hanging in water or drill mud. So you shouldn't get very much friction from there. And then the slip coupler actually really surprisingly, like uh, if I can maybe flash back, we'll see if I can do this, but uh, really was only like, you can see that it captures the rod friction really well. It should flatline. Oops, there. So, this. So yeah, um, you know, having that 15 to 20 degrees is you're, you're getting really close to capturing all of it because you can see that like the value is sort of flatlining and peaking. Um, you know, if it only rotated 10, you'd be in here and then it'd be a mystery. Uh, but it's like seeing that sort of flat line of, of twist, which kind of shows us that, you know, the twist is coming out of the rods. It's sort of at one sort of steady state. And then the other thing that then the stub correction, which we, I didn't really speak too much on either. It was, that was done afterwards because the values were looking a little bit high and, you know, sort of that NKT value was sort of getting to the upper range of what we thought was reasonable. So then we're back calculating um, using like, smoothness numbers and uh, diameter of the stub uh, as a reduction as well. So Max, uh, it's Colin Gregor here. Um, I, I I don't know if there's any more questions in the room, but I thought I'd just ask a follow up on that. I just just uh, to clarify. So that one twenty three that you're showing there, how was that value actually obtained? So that's read by the up hole uh, torque load cell. So uh, the load cell, the load cell is like up near the like mounted just below the motor. So. That's just straight from the, the reading of the load cell itself. So, you know, we're rotating the load cell and the drill rod string, and it's measuring those first 15 degrees of torque with the slip coupler. That, so the slip coupler spins freely for 15 degrees before engaging the blade. Um, and so that's what that 123 you're reading uh, is. And then you can see that the blade engages and then you get your peak uh your peak value oh i see so that's and that's where the plat you're explaining the plateau because anything after that you would assume would just be uniform. yeah exactly so anything after like the engagement of this of the blade which i think is let's see if i can get this laser pointer again so yeah so this is like the free spinning uh where just the rods are engaged and no blade and then you can see as soon as the blade engages you're getting your your peak there I see. So this is a continuous data set we're looking at here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, That's exactly. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and looking at the great, really good visuals in this presentation, especially the theme song at the end, I thought that was great. Um, the uh, 
one of the questions I have, I haven't done a lot of uh, barge drilling. So I'm wondering, um, just thinking about your drill depth datum for, uh, for a lot of these, because you're showing the waves. So you're dealing with tides, wave swells, drift, that kind of thing. So how was that taken into account? Was there no fixed connection between the, the drill stem and the barge itself? Or can you just provide yeah. a bit of information on that? Yeah, for sure. So uh, all depths are relative to uh, what we call mud line. And then that can be you know, referenced as from chart datum or geodetic elevation. Um, but all depths that you've seen here on the presentation are all from below Basically, we're calling zero C4. Um, and then as you're drilling, uh, your only connection is actually the, whatever the, how do I say this, I guess, um, casing stays in the hole and is held up by the ground once you reach a certain depth, you know, like the it's staying steady and the barge is moving around the casing. And then, if you're pushing CPT, let's say, your CPT rods are connected to the drill, which is connected to the barge. So you do actually have to account and do depth checks for the tidal movements. Um, we do them you know, sort of on the fly every meter and then officially about once every five meters. And you'll see small, small changes like maybe 10 centimeters or so over a course of a five meter push uh, that gets corrected in the data. Sometimes you're overcounting, sometimes you're undercounting, depending on the tidal fluctuation. Um, but then for all this vein shear testing, uh, your casing is set and fixed into the mud line, like into the seafloor. And then it is like you're mounting your motor and your drill string all to the casing. So it's independent of tidal, uh, tidal and wave effect. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Any question here? No. Okay. So we have uh, two questions online. The first one is where variables rate considered for the vein share when encountering sil uh, silty sandy soil? Yeah, uh, so var variable rate vein shear testing is, is definitely something that we're doing more and more of. We've been finding that it's uh, incredibly popular in tailings. Uh, for this project, we only did vein shear testing in that low clay unit. Um, and there's a very small section, I believe, of clay in the, the upper unit that we had uh, tested on the previous investigation. So we didn't consider variable rate testing because that wasn't important on, on this one. But the uh, Shelby tube samplings in the silty sands, that's sort of where the main parameters for that, uh, for that unit came from. Thank you. Uh, next question is, uh, thanks for the excellent talk. Uh, for such a CPT, do you ever experience any shaft inclination? Do you have mechanism to ensure the verticality or of shape? The mud plane has an undrained stretch of two, 250 kilopascal, interestingly high. Are they all glacial keel? Yeah, so a few questions in there. So I'll, I'll tackle them as best as uh, we can. Um, yeah, uh, inclination is definitely something that we experienced on this program. Um, as you're pushing, there's not very much that you can do to actually ensure verticality, especially on your initial push, as you know, the cone is just sort of gonna go where it wants to go. Generally, it tends to be very straight. Um, but the one really nice thing uh, for such a deep CPT is that you are guaranteed to do a drill out uh, to remove that frictional component. And a sonic drill, uh, I'm going to say, basically does not deviate. Uh, over a course of a 100 meter hole, you're less than one, one degree of inclination in that hole. Uh, I would say is often even less than half a degree, so incredibly vertical because it's not relying on rotation, it's relying on you know, the vibratory liquefaction as it's moving. So you know, your first push, you're gonna get a little bit of inclination effect, I would say on your CPT, you know, nothing more than you would typically. And 
But as you're getting deeper and deeper, you're starting each hole off basically plumb straight again and have rod support to hold it in place. So um, nothing too crazy for us uh, that we saw in this program for inclination. Um, are they all glacial till? Yeah, so it was definitely like a this program that clay and into the glacial till. Yeah, I think it's it's all glacial deposition below the uh, deltaic deposition. I think so. The clay and the the till, and then the deltaic delta comes on top of that. Perfect. Uh, we have time for one last question. So somebody here in the room has a question. If not, you let okay. me off easy. No, I oh. have one. No. Uh, no, my question is, uh, you have measurement of the pore pressure all the time and you have a saturation, a, 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 a way to measure the saturation. Do you cross that information and that cross of this of between the saturation and the pore pressure? They correspond and make sense. Yeah. So, um, sort of slightly too different. Um, at like ninety nine point nine percent saturation, we're just going to read it with the pore pressure data. It's going to read as like whatever your hydrostatic, especially in the silt sand, it's going to read as like hydrostatic you're not going to see that in the pore pressure data okay. um, because it's like teeny tiny little air bubbles in there the cone doesn't pick that up okay, okay so if there is no more questions so thank you very much for coming and see you all next week thanks everybody